Despite a rise in the total number of COVID-19 cases in Tarrant County, the Fort Worth Convention Center is on schedule to reopen next month. The Convention Center will reopen for events on July 25th and is already booked with events into June of next year. With the total number of COVID-19 cases sitting at 9,000, the Convention Center is putting in new health and safety guidelines. The guidelines include social distancing to prevent the spread of the virus disease. Right now, crews are sanitizing the building after it served as a temporary shelter for 1,600 homeless people over the past three months. The Convention Center is hoping groups that canceled events this year will rebook for next year to bring in much needed rev revenue to the city. Weddings are at their peak. The Ruth E. Jackson Center is doing their best to provide couples a memorable wedding while following CDC guidelines. The Bobcat reports Josepher Williams shows us what the center is doing to prevent the spread of COVID-19. When the first wave of COVID-19 started to spread, the general manager of the Ruthie Jackson Center, Cheryl Allgood, had to find new ways to social distance families and friends. With brides having weddings planned a year in advance and marriage licenses expiring, the Ruthie Jackson Center opened their doors for couples looking to get married. We had a location that would allow us to accommodate these brides because a lot of our weddings moved. And uh, it was a very kind, fulfilling thing to do. We were very, very fortunate that the city of Grand Prairie, who owns the Ruthie Jackson Center, allowed us to do that. And uh, it was just a win-win. Even with couples making last minute decisions on wedding venues, all good had no problems with married couples and their families. You know, we had to go along by the guidelines uh, from the state and the city and the county. And so we, we wanted them to be totally aware what the expectations were and what the times were. And everybody was just grateful and it was just a wonderful experience. We had not one problem. The Ruthie Jackson Center is still making accommodations to make sure couples are safe and preventing the spread of the disease. In Grand Prairie, Joseph Williams, the Bobcat Report. With the Texas Rangers season delayed due to COVID-19, their new Globe Life Park is getting put to good use. Since the end of May, the ballpark has hosted high school graduations for schools across the DFW area. Students and their families are among the first ones inside the new billion dollar stadium. With the numbers of COVID-19 cases still rising, entrants had to wear masks and must stay six feet apart. The Rangers expect 13,000 graduates to parade through the park over the course of the 49 graduation ceremonies scheduled this month. The Black Lives Matter movement is still in full effect as protests against social injustice have continued to move forward. The City of Austin's Transportation Department is helping the movement by painting a special message in front of the Capitol. Next on the Bobcat Report. Hello. I'm Joseph Williams. Thank you for joining us on another edition of the Bobcat Report. Cities nationwide have been painting Black Lives Matter street mural with Austin, Texas following suit. The Bobcat Report's Wisdom Ackman is in Austin with more on the display. With Hayes County having a record-breaking number of positive cases of COVID-19 in one day, this brings a deep concern to students at Texas State where they are questioning if their fall semester will be on campus. Texas State has stated to students and staff that they will continue to have classes on campus for the summer two and fall courses. Texas State said that they are implementing protective measures for the return of campus. They are requiring students and staff to wear face coverings, decreasing the capacity of classrooms and offices, and improving cleaning and disinfecting. It is also highly encouraged to get tested if showing symptoms. The university has eight work groups that are thoroughly conducting scenario-based planning that will provide what the next semester will look like for students and staff. The reopening plan will be released by the end of this week. As Hayes County coronavirus numbers reach an all-time high, the correlation is most likely due to COVID-19 testing and demographics. Abbott concluded that Hayes County had 265 positive cases in one day, but had zero the day before and zero the day after. This could be because of the accessible free mobile testing. The population in Hayes County has a majority of people under the age of 30. Abbott believes higher rate of cases could be a cause of social gatherings at bars or could date back to Memorial Day, but says it's hard to tell. As of Wednesday, the county has had 1,238 confirmed cases with 17 hospitalized and five dead. 
Earlier testing is proven to help prevent spread and is encouraged nationwide. If you live in or near Hayes County, there will be free mobile testing June 20th at Bowie Elementary starting at 10 a.m. Visit txcovidtest.org or register for your appointment. A furniture store and food bank have teamed up to give back to the community. Houston Galleria Furniture and the Houston Food Bank have partnered to offer residents in Fort Bend County free meals. The distribution site is held at the South Richmond store with a contactless drive through system. Residents are able to stay in their cars while volunteers place food in their trunks. Their goal is to provide 1,500 meals to people a day. The next distribution dates are set to take place tomorrow and early next week. San Marcos High School Summer Strength and Conditioning Program is over almost as soon as it started. The workout started June 8th, but on Tuesday evening, the school announced on Facebook that they have suspended the program. This comes after an athlete who attended the workouts on the first day later tested positive for COVID-19. The district said that due to the precautionary measures that were in place, further exposure was limited and those who were in contact with the individual have been notified by the athletic department. The school says that they will continue to monitor the situation and hope to resume the program on July 6. A school district is set to offer off-campus physical educational training for students in the fall. Fort Bend ISD will allow students to pick the coaches and the program of their choice. Programs vary by category from participation in national level competitions to half hour weekly activities. The application is now posted on the school's district website. Fort Bend ISD says any changes made will be posted to their webpage and communicated to parents and students. After the break, we show how a rolling museum is bringing the history of World War II to residents of Fredericksburg. Next on the Bobcat Report. Back to the Bobcat Report, I'm hosted by Executive Director of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, Mr. John F. Burrell. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. All right, so we're just going to jump into the questions. Uh, so with the protests going on around the world, what has been your message to members, whether it's being to stay safe or how they go about protesting? Well, we feel it's extremely important with all of the unreadiness that we do have that our members take an active part of their First Amendment rights to do that. And what we want to stress uh, with them, yes, we, we truly uh, embrace and support the protest efforts, uh, we should say peaceful protests and marching efforts, uh, particularly staying safe because we are in still in the midst of a pandemic. <clears throat> it's important that they take care of themselves because as they're out protesting and marching, peaceful protesting and marching, uh, we don't know what someone else may have and taking that back home to their family. We want them to be careful and making sure they're being conscientious, conscientious of that. So all those things are very important. And, and making sure that their voices is heard, that's an, an, an extremely important. Their voice be heard, their issues are heard, and then they can make be a change agent. And one of those important things that they can do in making those changes is in two ways. One, the census is going to be key in how funding is going to be allocated in our communities to make sure that we can have those added protections, you know, in the next 10 years. And voting, registering to vote, and then actually and vote to make that change. You're not going to make the change who's in City Hall unless you go out and vote. You're not going to make that change to see who's your governor unless you go out and vote. You're not going to be able to make that change who are your senators and representatives unless you go out and vote. Who are in the prosecution office, lead attorneys, those changes, the sheriffs, those changes will not happen until you go out and cast your vote. All right, thank you. And my next question is, has Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated made any donations to anybody in the African American community? Or are you planning to make any donations to help out the African American community? Well, directly and indirectly. Indirectly, our, our contributions have been not just now, but year long, as we are members of the NAACP. And that is our largest civil rights organization who are professionals at what it takes to make sure that our voices are heard even on a national regional and local platform. Dollars that each of us as members contribute to our membership dues, we allocate <clears throat> a percentage of those dollars to go directly to the NAACP, which they feel and take those dollars to uh, act on our behalf in those causes that are important to us. And my last question for you today, um, 
seeing one of your members, Colin Kaepernick, he's been pretty much a vocal leader for the change of, for the African American community and social injustice. How's it been for you guys as a organization, seeing one of your members go out and be a voice for change? And um, what is it like having him as a vocal leader for your community? Well, you, as we can all recall, uh, several years ago, uh, he got it right. Uh, and the purpose of what he was doing and why he was doing it was taking it in a different way than what it is today. He was absolutely right in what he was peacefully protesting. He was peacefully showing and expressing what it meant and what was going on in the African-American community about police brutality. He was peacefully informing us, you know, four years ago of these injustices and some of the things he was saying fell on deaf ear. But it's absolutely a tremendous honor to know someone of his caliber at that age during that time peacefully took a stance on what was an injustice and trying to make it right. So we're extremely happy and proud of him. And we participate as he sees us and want us to participate on his behalf. So we don't do anything that he's not uh, willing to make sure that we that we do. We want to do to accent for anything else that we can do our, for our First Amendment rights, but also want to make sure we respect him what he does also. All right, and to let you go, is there anything that you would like to say to the African-American community about being safe or how to go about protesting to end it off? Well, I think those peaceful protests are extremely important. Yes, we should be vocal. Yes, we should be active. Yes, you, be, she, you should be doing those things to take care of yourself. But this will all be for naught until we go and exercise that right and pull that label to cast a vote. We must get out in November and cast those votes for the, for the issues and the processes that will make a change in our communities. And yes, we must get out and complete the census to make sure that federal dollars will be able to allocate it to our communities for the next 10 years.